Okay, we're recording now. Great. And then uh, let me introduce us. My name is Michael Holmes. I'm a freelance journalist uh, in Potsdam, Germany. I'm specialized in uh, conflict and war violence uh, around the world uh, and modern history. I'm talking to Rashid Khalidi, a historian of the Middle East at Columbia University. Uh, Mr. Khalidi, you have also written many books on the Middle East, including The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, which I highly recommend. I have learned a lot from the book. And I have to say, it is a balanced view. You are doing your best to be fair. You're a Palestinian yourself. You have suffered from the conflict, as uh, all of your compatriots. But you are doing your best to show empathy and understand the perspective of the other side of Israelis. So uh, you have also worked as an advisor to Palestinian negotiators in the 1990s in Madrid. And Washington. Okay. Um, so Mr. Khalidi, Khalidi, sorry. Actually, First, Khalidi is more correct. Khalidi is more correct? Yeah. Okay. Accents on the first syllable. Oh, the first question is, uh, is is personal because I'm sure like every Palestinian these days and probably every Israeli, um, you have strong feelings at the moment. How are you feeling these days? Um, I'm feeling great distress. Um, I have family uh, there um, in, in, in the Gaza Strip and in other parts of Palestine. Uh, I have many, many students and friends. Um, in Palestine and Israel, former students and friends. Um, and so I'm feeling a great deal of distress, especially at the enormous loss of civilian life in, in Gaza uh, that's ongoing right now. Mm -hmm. And what are your initial thoughts at the moment? It's, um, it's most important to, to understand from your perspective. I mean, I I think that the something that's very important is to understand that under international humanitarian law and under any moral standard, uh, civilian life uh, is should be protected to the extent possible. Um, that would apply to Israeli civilians, and that would apply to Palestinian civilians. Um, unless one applies a perverse moral scale, um, that should apply across the board. Um, and so I, I, while I, I feel that for most people in the world that's understood, I think it's not as well as understood as it should be in some parts of the West, the United right. States and Western Europe. Um, there, I think, are other assumptions about what is called Israel's right to self-defense and issues like proportionality and protection of civilians and, 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 and non-combatants in situations of war that are not fully understood. Um, it's very clear that if Israeli civilians are killed, as happened, especially on the 7th, that these are civilians, these are, these are non-combatants, but somehow the killing of right now somewhere close to 9,000 or 9,500 Palestinian civilians does not evoke the same kind of concern. And I find that very distressing. That's not true for everybody. I think much public opinion in the West is actually quite sympathetic to that point of view, that all human life is, is, is precious and that international humanitarian law applies to everybody and that all civilians, non-combatants should be kept as safe as possible. But for most of our politicians, unfortunately, and for much of our media, unfortunately, and for many institutions in our society, that's not simply the case. Some human lives are more important. Some civilian lives, I should say, are more important than others. And that to me is very distressing. I I'm quite shocked by the level of propaganda right now, even in Germany, but also in the US, because 
I'm used to that on this conflict, but it's I think it's quite extreme right now because it's so obvious that war crimes are committed every day. And they tell us all the time that, you know, their Hamas is hiding, uh, you know, under under civilians is using human shields and this kind of stuff. I mean, it's almost like an absurd question to ask. Nevertheless, I I feel like I have to ask what's what's your reaction to that? Why? Why is that not a good argument? Why is there not a justification for what's happening yeah. in any way? Well, I mean, every irregular military force hides in the sea of its people. Fish swim in the sea. Um, in addition, in Gaza, there's nowhere to hide. There's no, right. no, I mean, it's a tiny space. Um, military installations are located in and around Israeli communities, and nobody says that Israel hides behind human shields. Right. Um, they may be more more clearly separated. Uh, they probably are, but um, I mean, if you look carefully at the at the map of the areas around Gaza, um, there are military bases dotted amongst the civilian uh, communities, among the you know the communities. Um, so I, I think that's actually a, a, a brilliant talking point, but mm -hmm. it doesn't absolve any armed force of the responsibility to obey international humanitarian law. Whether there are combatants among civilians or whether they're out in the field offering to be killed should make no difference in terms of international humanitarian law. To the extent possible, civilians should be protected. Um, and in the case of Israel, its leaders have specifically adopted something that was called, um, right after the 2006 war, the Bahia Doctrine, by, in fact, an Israeli general who is currently in this war cabinet, a man named Gadi Eisenkot. He was then a major general. He was then the chief of planning, I think, of the Israeli army. He later became chief of staff, and he enunciated what he called the Dahiya Doctrine, which he said, we will not respect the principle of proportionality, which is the central principle of international humanitarian law, where it applies to non-combatants. And he said, we will destroy civilian targets. He said that, villages, urban regions. He was talking about the Dahiya, the suburb of South Beirut, which yeah. the Israeli Air Force flattened in 2006, killing many hundreds of civilians. So... We have a, a, a serial violator of international humanitarian law, not just doing that surreptitiously, but announcing that it will violate, it intends to, and has, and will continue to violate international humanitarian law insofar as these principles are concerned. And yet nobody asks the question, human shields, I mean, every Israeli talking point is repeated and repeated and repeated by our politicians and by our media. And basic facts like Gandhi Eisenkot has said, I will commit and my country will commit war crimes is never a question asked of Israelis. Mm -hmm. Never, never. I've never heard anybody mention the Bahia Doctrine in any media. I've dealt with a great deal of media in the last many years and a, a great deal, much even more in the last four weeks, three weeks, four weeks. I haven't heard one person mention it. One media, uh, one, one, one journalist mentioned it. In fact, it also almost seems like uh, senior politicians and army leaders in, in Israel are agreeing with us. They say, yeah, we are going to be, there are no civilians in Gaza. Some of them um, have said that. That's correct. Right. And it, it almost seems like they are, they would disagree with those um, Western propagandists who are trying to come up with excuses for Israel. And they would agree with us and say, no, we are doing it. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I have to ask like the the the, qu the big question, which is way too big, and people should really look into your book for this. But uh, what can you tell us about the root causes of the whole conflict? Well, first, it's it's a recent conflict. It's a product of the development of modern nationalism. It's a product of uh, Western imperialism. Before modern nationalism, there were no Israelis and no Palestinians. There was a Jewish people, there were Arabs in Palestine, they had ethnic and linguistic and historical and religious roots of different sorts. But um, the conflict is a function of the rise of modern 
uh, political Zionism and of the rise of nationalism among Palestinians. It's a function of the British imperial decision to establish a settler colony in Palestine under the Balfour Declaration and the Mandate for Palestine. Without those factors, that nationalism and British imperialism, you would not have had the conflict we have today. You might have had a form of Zionism, you might have had uh, uh, other other things happening. But what we have today is a conflict between a national movement, which is also a settler colonial movement, and which since its inception always saw itself as part of Europe, always saw itself as both entitled to Palestine with rights in Palestine, but also as a settler and a colonial movement. Uh, you had something called the Jewish Colonization Agency. This is not my name for it. This is not some anti-Semitic smear of Zionism. This is what Zionists called their land purchase agency. And they talked about settlement and they talked about colonialism and they talked about the Arabs. People like Jabotinsky, at least, the honest ones amongst them, recognized that this was a colonial conflict. So it starts from those roots as well as being a national conflict, obviously. You have had developed a national movement on both sides. You have had developed national consciousness on both sides at approximately the same time within a generation of each other. Um, and those national movements are in conflict, but it's not an equal conflict. This is not France and Germany. Okay, this is a settler colonial movement backed by the greatest powers in world history at every stage of its existence. Yep. So it's not the poor little Zionists in Palestine all by themselves against seas of hostile Arabs. It's Zionism backed by the British Empire, the greatest empire of its time, mm -hmm. against Palestinians supported by Arab peoples, most of whom are under colonial control in the, in the, in the, in the uh, mandate period up to 1948. And Israel supported by Western powers, most notably the United States, against the Palestinians supported by various forces, but less powerful ones, invariably. Mm -hmm. So it's always been an unequal conflict. Mm -hmm. Always, from the beginning, from the moment Herzl solicits the Kaiser, from the moment that Herzl solicits the French government, from the moment Herzl solicits the Ottoman Sultan, and from the moment Weizmann succeeds in gaining the support of Great Britain, Zionism has always depended on extremely powerful European imperialist forces, and later American power, to impose itself in Palestine. So that's the basic nature of what we see. It hasn't changed in some respects. What you see in the West Bank, rampaging settlers driving Palestinians out, is part of a process that goes back to 1948. And it has its roots, as I say, in this, in this earlier settler colonial process, which is still ongoing, which is why Palestinians, when they talk about the Nakba of 1948, say that this is continued, because efforts to push the Palestinians out of Palestine or into smaller and smaller parts of Palestine have been ongoing ever since 1948. Even after the Nakba, when 750,000 people were pushed out of what became Israel, Israel shot and killed every person who tried to return. Israel squeezed the Arab population that remained into smaller and smaller areas and took their land for exclusive use by Jewish settlers and has operated on the same principles ever since, whether in the West Bank or in Jerusalem, or in uh, the Golan, occupied Golan Heights, Syrian Golan Heights, or in the Gaza Strip. So some characteristics of this process have not changed over time. Obviously, many others have. I would say that in your book, you show quite convincingly that there was never any offer for a Palestinian state that would have made possible a two-state solution, which could have been a solution. Um, Rabin and later uh, Barack, um, you could say, and later on, maybe, maybe got close um, in some way, but they didn't quite get there. Um, maybe it wasn't their own fault, but because of the opposition in Israel, but um, that doesn't is not a big help to the Palestinians. So to summarize your book, you, you're actually saying that there never wasn't any serious solution to the conflict from the Israeli side since 1967. Um, that could have been acceptable to a Palestinian leadership. Is that, is that correct? That's absolutely correct. It's not just acceptable to a Palestinian leadership that met the minimum requirement of the Palestinians for equal rights in Palestine. 
yeah. equal rights of sovereignty, equal rights of movement, equal rights to security. Um, several Israeli leaders were willing to negotiate. Netanyahu is not. Several Israeli leaders were willing to change Israeli positions, modify yeah. Israeli positions. I would not call them concessions because these were things that involved Palestinian rights. So, um, right. Israel accepts a Palestinian right. It's not making a concession. Something it's not it's it's not theirs to give to say we right. will give you Hebron. Hebron's not theirs, or whatever is not theirs. Uh, however, three Israeli leaders, certainly at least uh, Rabbi uh, uh, Barak and Olmert, in different ways at different times, were willing at least to negotiate and to change important Israeli positions. Uh, Rabin agreed that the Palestinians were people. No Israeli leader had ever said that. Golda Meir had said only a few years earlier, or less than 10 years earlier, uh, no, in 1969, a little more than 15 years earlier, uh, that the, the, the Palestinians didn't even exist. And that right. was an Israeli position. It is still a position of many Israeli leaders, by the way, to this day. So he, he, he accepted that. He accepted that the Palestinians were represented by the PLO, which was an important shift. And he accepted right. to negotiate with the PLO, which is an equally important shift. So he made a major moves in terms of Israel's previous positions. He did not, however, at any stage, accept the idea of fully independent sovereign statehood for the Palestinians. In his last speech before the Knesset, he said, we will offer the Palestinians less than a state. Right. And he said, we will control the Jordan River Valley. What does that mean? Continued occupation and control of the occupied territories. So even Rabin, who made these important changes in Israel's position, up until his death, was not ready to give the Palestinians what the Israelis insisted on for themselves, which is sovereign, independent statehood and uh, freedom from control by another, another power. Uh, Barak made changes in that. Uh, Olmert made changes in that. But none of them accepted. what well, it's not just what Palestinian leaders were. It's not just what Palestinian leaders were demanding. It's what the Palestinians demanded as their rights, Palestinian people. And after that, I think that's that's easy to show. Like uh, every Israeli government uh, tended to be more right wing and more right wing. First Sharon, then Netanyahu, Netanyahu again, and now he's brought like extreme settler parties into the the government. Um, and uh, so the, the the occupation and the situation both in Gaza and in the West Bank became more and more untenable. And I would say by now, anybody like even before this attack by Hamas and this latest escalation, anybody who really believed that Israel was serious uh, about making peace with the Palestinians is either like, um, I don't know, like a complete idiot, uh, uninformed or, or crazy. I don't know. Um, but um, let me let me play a little bit uh, the the advocatus diaboli. Um, I'll make a, a German one. Um, many Germans, I would say, they, they 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 do understand that the Palestinians suffer and that they are victims of injustice. But nevertheless, they feel I would say most of them feel a bit closer to Israel, and the reason is they they think that. Um, while Palestinians have often been discriminated and they're occupied. Israel has little choice because they tried so hard, but you already, this is something you already discussed. Um, but they believe that um, especially Hamas, but also the other leading Palestinian um, armed groups are hell-bent on destroying Israel, killing all the Jews, this is important, and committing a second Holocaust. And therefore, in our case, like of Germany, but I think many American pro-Israeli groups would say the same thing. It is our responsibility that despite all the, you know, despite Israel not being perfect when it comes to human rights and all that, um, to support it in their um, essential right of self-defense. So if I if I was like, a, I'd say I would be like a pro-peace Israeli in Tel Aviv, and I always try to, to make peace, and I understand that Palestinians deserve their own state and human dignity and all that. But after this Hamas attack, I would feel um, maybe the maybe the right in Israel was was right all along. Maybe they do want to kill us all, and I would certainly be scared if I would 
be an Israeli right now of Hamas. And what would you say if I tell you, well, look, I know we never tried very hard to make peace, but you really fucked it up now. And now we have no choice but to destroy Hamas and it's ugly, but what are we supposed to do? Yeah. Um, well, you've summed up so many central elements of the Israeli narrative. Right. It's very hard to answer. We only have a limited amount of time. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how many of them I can pick apart. Um, the, the thing, one of the many things that's missing, first of all, all of this starts in not just Germany, but the West, from a well-deserved sense of guilt vis-a-vis the Jewish people for what Christian Europe has done to them over a millennia and more, a millennium and more. And I'm not just talking about the Holocaust, and I'm not just talking about pogroms. I'm talking about the wholesale expulsion of the entire Jewish community from countries like England and France in medieval times. Um, just one second. Intimatia? And that drives much of this sentiment, unfortunately, and it is played upon by Israelis. So the evocation of the Holocaust, the evocation of the possible extermination of the entire Jewish, or, or the, of Israel and of Israelis, um, involves evoking those horrible memories and, 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 and triggering feelings of guilt, well-deserved feelings of guilt among Westerners, not just Germans, Americans, British. And the British passed a law under Lord under Balfour when he was prime minister in 1905, the Alien Exclusion Act, to prevent refugees from Zionist, from Tsarist pogroms from coming to England. The United States passed laws in 1924 to prevent Jewish immigrants, Jewish and other non-desirables from coming to the United States. So the United States and Britain and other Western countries that refused to take people who are fleeing persecution and later on were fleeing the Nazis when they could still escape before World War II, share a huge share of guilt for what happened during World War II in the Holocaust. And I think that that's that's the background to this. Um, as far as Palestinian, uh, uh, what Palestinian uh, uh, militant groups say, the first thing is when the overwhelming majority of the Palestinian national movement renounced violence, when the PLO renounced violence in 1988, Hamas was nothing. Hamas was nothing. There was almost no opposition. When we went to Madrid and Washington, the support for a peaceful solution among Palestinians was overwhelming. When Arafat signed the Oslo Accords on the White House lawn in 1993, support for peace among Palestinians and a two-state solution was overwhelming. There was opposition, but it was a, a small minority. That continued to be the case for most of the 1990s. So why did that change? Why did a small minority become a much larger minority? Why did they carry out suicide bombings in the 1990s and later on? It's not as if suddenly some drug affected them. Israeli behavior, Israeli positions, Israeli actions, the unceasing expansion of the settlement process, even while Israel was negotiating in Madrid and Washington, even while they negotiated the Oslo Accords, the, the number of settlements doubled and tripled. The occupation became infinitely more restrictive in 1993, 94, 95, 96, Palestinians moved freely all around historic Palestine until 1993. You could take a car with West Bank license plates, drive from Jerusalem to the Golan Heights, or from Jerusalem to Gaza City. Nobody would stop you. The imprisonment of the Palestinians in Bantustans, in the West Bank, and the imprisonment of Gaza starts with Oslo. Israel created a situation where violence appeared the only option. Israel created Hamas indirectly by its policies, by its refusal to accept a sovereign Palestinian state. I just answered that question. Israel never offered Palestinian sovereignty or statehood or equality, never. You combine that with Rabin, 
פרס, נתניהו, ברק, אולמרט, שרון, every single Israeli government, increasing the enclosure and the restrictions on Palestinians, increasing, expanding the settlement process. We have three quarters of a million Israeli settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. 700,000, 800,000, somewhere in between those numbers. This is nothing, this is not important. Palestinians are supposed to be nonviolent and, and, and are supposed to continue to support what was the majority opinion. Israel, Israel's violence, settlement involves violence. You're stealing land, you have to kick people off. Right. Closing off the West Bank in Gaza involves violence. Policing the West Bank and East Jerusalem involves violence. Imprisonment is violence. And resistance can be pacific or, or violent. Now, were Palestinians willing to follow a peaceful course in their overwhelming majority from sometime in the 1980s until the end of the 1990s? Yes. How did Israel reciprocate? No Palestinian state. No halt to settlement, a much, much, much more intense and vigorous and restrictive and harsh occupation. Well, you had violence, <laughs> naturally, inevitably, necessarily. Do I, I, I'm sorry. I'm gonna turn my phone off, I, I'm sorry. No um, so that's how I would answer this. I mean, again, gross misconceptions systematic misinformation and guilt produce this toxic blend of lies and half-truths, which is the point of view that you put forward. Nothing, none of it is true. Are there Palestinians who want to eliminate Israel? Yes. Were there always Palestinians who want? Yes. Did they want to kill everybody? Maybe not. That's not the point. Are there Palestinians today who want to eliminate Israel? Yes. Are there Palestinians who support violence? Yes. Were Palestinians in a different place for a decade and a half? Yes. Why did that change? Well, I think you have to ask that question. And you also have to ask, were there opportunities, even with groups that once advocated or once practiced violence, were there opportunities that were ignored or that were missed? In the early 2000s, after Mahmoud Abbas was elected in 2005, and after Hamas won a plurality in the Legislative Council elections of 2006, a unity government was formed between Fatah and Hamas, which offered under, under Abu Mazen, under Abbas, to negotiate with Israel. The West and, 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 and Israel turned that down. They said, no, Israel, uh, Hamas has to renounce violence, coded as terrorism, and has to accept the existence of Israel as a precondition for negotiations. That's not the yeah. end of negotiations, violence stops. No, we, we, we continue our systematic unceasing violence of occupation and colonization. You stop resisting violence. And a priori, before we talk, you accept our existence as we define it, and then we will agree to talk to you, if, if then. And in fact, Netanyahu would not have agreed to talk. Uh, Olmert might have. But the next government did not, would not. So was this an opportunity? Maybe, maybe not. There's no guarantee that a coalition government would have been able to reach an agreement with Israel. But the United States refused. Europe refused. Israel refused. So again, this narrative of they've always wanted to kill us, always, always. All they wanted to do was kill us. They're Jew killers. They're no different than the Nazis. Is a, is a completely false narrative. Uh, 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 Begin used it in 1982, talking about Hitler in his bunker, comparing Arafat in besieged West Beirut to, to, to Hitler in Berlin at the end of World War II. He constantly used those metaphors. And that's been a trope of Israeli propaganda ever since they focused on the Mufti, who did in fact collaborate with the Nazis during World War II. And it's always been a central element. Well, there were many other Palestinian leaders who didn't. There were many Palestinians who fought in the British army against Germany. Though they don't count. The Mufti went to Germany. And that, even when it's completely, that's not fictitious. That's true. He did. But <laughs> other elements of this are completely fictitious. It, I'm sorry the answer was so long, but it's it, there are so many lies packed into that narrative. Right, so many that's... half-truths. So much disinformation and misinformation and ignorance. No, thank you so much for that. 
Um, I think uh, an argument that is not made often enough, both by Palestinians and pro. By the way, Michael, I, I have I have another interview in about what time is it? One thirty in about twenty minutes. All right. If, so, if that's um, okay. Another argument I think that is often missing on the pro-Palestinian uh, side by uh, protesters and Palestinian groups is I think we should more often point out that um, that the U.S. and Europe could force Israel to do what's best for their own security. Because to me, it's obvious that their politics in Palestine is the biggest threat to Israeli security for the reasons you just pointed out. Um, shouldn't that be more emphasized? I, I certainly think so. I think that if Western politicians had the true interests of Israelis yeah. at heart, as well as their own, the interests of their own countries and the interest of peace and stability in the region, uh, they would not have followed the policies that they followed of uh, blindly and unquestioningly following whatever course Israel chooses. If Israel says killing 9,000 people is a self-defense, American officials say Israel has the right to defend itself. I'm not sure killing 9,000 people is a good way to ensure the security of Israel into the next decade. In fact, I'm sure it's not. I, I can guarantee you that it's not. I can guarantee you that those 9,000 people and the 20,000 people so far who have been injured um, will not look kindly on Israel in the, in the next, in the years to come. And that the people who are now fighting them are the children of people in many cases whom they killed. Uh, now, can people who fought each other sit down eventually and negotiate? Yes, they can. Um, every conflict that has been resolved in South Africa and Ireland um, shows that that's the case. Um, Arafat was willing to sit down with Rabin. Rabin was responsible for the expulsion of Palestinians from Lid and Ramli in 1948. He and Yigal Alon were the commanders that kicked out tens of thousands of Palestinians at Ben Gurion's order. He sat down with them. So I'm not saying it 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 makes it impossible, but I don't think it makes it easier. Uh, it, similarly, the killing of Israeli civilians certainly does not make it easier. It, it was, it, as happened on the seventh of, of of October, does not make easier uh, 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 any kind of resolution. It seems to me like I wonder because I am I'm quite shocked at the moment by the reaction of the U.S., Britain, and Germany, and the European Union, and uh, because I've always tried to tell people that the West is quite capable of doing horrible things. You've seen it also in Yemen and Syria and uh, Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, but now. What is different, I feel, is that they're, in a way, they're fanatical about this. They are very emotionally attached to Israel, uh, the, 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 the leaders and of Western leaders. And I find that quite shocking. And they put a lot of pressure on every, everybody criticizing them in any way to try to discredit everybody and make them right. look like, you know, like sympathizing with this horrible massacres by Hamas. Right, right, right. And... I feel quite, I find that quite disturbing. And if I try to imagine what this looks like from when you're Palestinian, it must be even more disturbing because it's like where, <laughs> it seems like they, the most important powers in the world are so completely on the side of, of, of your enemies. That must yeah. be so disheartening. Uh, so it is, it is disheartening. Uh, it is disheartening. But I think, we all have to remember, 66% of Americans in the latest poll favor a, a, a ceasefire, mm -hmm. which means they don't accept the Israeli narrative. They don't accept the position of their government. So our government and the two political parties and the media and the great corporations and the powers in this society, the universities, are all, are all pushing the narrative that you just mentioned. You are baby killers. You are terrorists if you support Palestinian rights. You are anti-Semites if you're anti-Zionist. That's the line being pushed, mm -hmm. and it will turn it. It will be it will be developed into law, and regulations, and restrictions on free speech, all over this country. But that's the powers that be. That's not public opinion. Public opinion is on another side. Not all of it, but a huge proportion of it. If 66% support a ceasefire, that means that they haven't drunk the Kool-Aid of Israeli propaganda. 
mm-hmm. which is whatever we do is justified and we'll do it as long as we want and we won't stop no matter what you say and you have to support us and anybody who disagrees is a terrorist and a baby killer and a nazi and worse than isis and un- unadulterated evil and i'm not even repeating what israelis say i'm repeating what the president of the united states said on repeated occasions so it's disheartening but at the same time it's heartening to realize that the few western european countries and the few white settler colonies including the united states and canada and so on are not the world they may have the money they may have the aircraft carriers but the big countries indonesia bangladesh india pakistan nigeria china brazil all the people with the exception of a few people in western europe and these white settler colonies all the people don't accept any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, they may be critical of, of Hamas or they may be appalled by the killing of civilians, but they don't follow the rest of this down the, down the rabbit hole into, into uh, uh, an Israeli uh, 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 series of Israeli talking points. So what's heartening is the rest of the world is with Palestinian rights, even if they're critical of Palestinian means or this or that. And they don't follow into saying, therefore, any advocate of Palestine is a terrorist and must be shut up. Must not and most of the world was shocked by what Hamas did in Israel. Of course. Too. So it's, Every, I mean, almost everybody was shocked. Once, I, once I feel like the, the majority out. of mankind uh, has a very nuanced view, but they sympathize a, a lot with the Palestinians right now and are shocked. Um, it's because and, unlike some places and some people, an Israeli child or an Israeli woman or an Israeli civilian should not be harmed. But that's equally true for a Palestinian child or woman or civilian. Yeah. I mean, they see them as people of the same level of humanity. And th- they don't privilege one over the other. And in international humanitarian law, there's no, there's no such privilege. Uh, whereas, clearly, for some other people, they are not equal. For some people, the death of 900 or 1100 or whatever number ultimately we find out of Israeli civilians who were unarmed, non-combatant civilians who were killed, it has more valence and more weight and more, more moral value and justifies more than the death of so far 9,500 or whatever. I don't even know what the toll is. Yeah. And it will be much higher by the time this is over. Exactly. I have one, more, one last important question. Yes. Um, I actually have to go very soon. Yes. Okay. Um, how how afraid are you of an escalation like that the war moves on to Lebanon, maybe even Iran or Syria? I think that is something to fear. It is something that should be of grave concern to everybody. Um, because there might be no limit to it. It might end up in, heaven forbid, not just a regional war, but nuclear war or world war, even if the United States is drawn in it. Russia is drawn in. You know, it could happen. I hope and think that the there are good reasons that it might be averted. I think that Iran, Hezbollah, Israel, and the United States probably, I hope, do not want a wider war. Right. Each for its own reasons. Uh, Hezbollah's leader just gave a speech today. It's very clear he's not pushing for a wider war. Mm-hmm. Um, And it's very clear the Iranians don't want a wider war. And the United States, I think, does not want a wider war. I'm sure Israel also. As far as I can tell, all of those four key actors do not seem to want a much wider war. Now, does that mean that they control the situation? No. Does that mean that something unexpected might not trigger a war? I mean, you can go back and understand how World War I started. Nobody wanted World War I. One thing led to another thing, led to escalation. We know we know how World War One started. Mm-hmm. It was not like other wars where there's a clear war of aggression. Somebody decides they will make war. Hamas decided to attack Israel. Right. That was not. You can argue there's a background, there's a context, whatever. That's all true. But there was a decision taken. Israel decided to invade Lebanon in 1982. That's different than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about unplanned, uncontrolled escalation that that could happen. So I think that's something to fear, but I hope, and I think there's good reason to assume that at least those four main actors um, will restrain themselves. Okay. I think I'll let you go. 
Um, I've got to go, actually. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. All the best to your family and friends. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I have family. I, I worry about them all the time. <laughs>